talked about quantum yield as the probability of an excited state doing a given process. Another way to think about quantum yield, since it involves a process initiated from an excited state, is as the ratio of the number of some event taking place, our event of interest, divided by the number of photons absorbed by the sample. Since each absorption event produces an excited state, this gives us a measure of the total number of excited state molecules generated, and of course the probability of this event occurring is the number of events we see divided by the total number of excited state molecules generated. Thinking about quantum yield in this way gives us an intuitive way to measure quantum yield by counting the number of events we see, for example, measuring the yield of a photochemical reaction with knowledge of the photon flux through the sample and knowledge of the number of photons absorbed. The question here, I mean, measuring the product yield is obviously trivial and comparing it to the stoichiometry of our starting substrate is trivial. The tricky part here is counting photons. How do we count the number of photons absorbed by the sample? We can of course use absorbance to do that if we know the initial photon flux through the sample, but how do we count the number of photons impinging on the sample in the first place? That's the subject of this video. One strategy for doing this involves taking advantage of chemical systems where the quantum yield is very, very precisely known. Those are called actinometers, and the practice of using those to measure quantum yields is called actinometry. One thing we should make clear from the outset is that counting photons is generally very difficult because it's very inefficient. We have a tendency to miss a lot of photons. This is particularly true when we talk about odd irradiation geometries. For example, in oddly shaped photochemical reactors where maybe the goal is to maximize our yield of a product in some photochemical reaction by maximizing absorption and using some weird reactor geometry to achieve that. The challenge if we want to measure quantum yield in that configuration is that this odd irradiation geometry gives us a tendency to miss a lot of photons due to scattering, so on and so forth. And even if, for example, we're using an instrument to measure photons, to count photons, the efficiency response of that instrument can vary by the manufacturer, by the place the instrument was manufactured, or even by the day. They, it tends to change over time. And so, you know, naively, if we were to ask how can we count photons, we would probably start with some kind of physical device. Right, a physical detector like a photomultiplier tube. These take advantage of the photoelectric effect and kick out electrons when a photon impinges on a metal plate that engages with that photon due to the photoelectric effect. We can also use photodiodes, which work on a principle of allowing current flow through a semiconductor layer when a photon impinges on the sample. And thermopiles can also be used to measure infrared photon flux. But all of these suffer from these problems, and so physical detectors, while useful if we have the means to calibrate them, do require calibration, and so we can't just plug them in and, and go. They don't just work, so to speak. We have to make sure that they're calibrated. Because physical detectors need calibration anyway, it's often more convenient to make use of a system where we know in great detail the quantum yield of a particular process, and this is what's known as a chemical actinometer. By engaging an actinometer and looking at, for example, how many times a process takes place and taking advantage of the very precisely known quantum yield of the process, which has typically been measured by many groups many times over time under many different circumstances, we can determine the quantum yield of a process running in parallel under those exact same circumstances. We'll look at how this plugs in to an actual experiment to measure a quantum yield in a second, but I wanted to start by covering a very common, very popular, and very classic example of a chemical actinometer. I actually have direct experience with this as we've taught uh, a lab in the first year chemistry labs at Georgia Tech you, uh, where we synthesize potassium ferrioxalate, and I've noticed for many years that it photodegrades. It goes from a bright green color to this dull brown. That's been taken advantage of, and this has been the case for now many, many decades, as an actinometer, that photodegradation process of potassium ferrioxalate. And it works like this. So the potassium ferrioxalate anion is right here. It's put in aqueous solution, and it can essentially disproportionate with iron 3 plus ions that are dissolved in solution separate from the oxalates to form this FEC204 and FEC204 2 minus ion. So this is a disproportionation process that happens in solution in the absence of light. Where light comes in, and this is really the key step, is in engaging with this FEC204 plus. This results in an internal electron transfer event inside 
this molecule. If we actually dig into the charges here, the iron has a charge of plus three and the oxalate has a charge of minus two so that the overall complex has a charge of plus one. The light absorption causes a photo-induced electron transfer process to take place sort of within the complex from the oxalate to the iron giving Fe2 plus and C2O4 minus. What we're really dealing with here, the C2O4 minus anion is a radical anion, and that can engage with another molecule of FeC2O4 plus to form Fe2 plus oxalate and 2CO2. And this is just a basic redox process without the involvement of light. However, it's important to consider this because it's a means of consuming the oxalate radical anion. The quantum yields of the overall processes based, for example, on the overall yield of Fe2+, plus, as a function of the number of photons impinging on the sample, is precisely known. So we know the quantum yield of this overall light-driven reduction of the Fe3+, plus to Fe2+, plus, and oxidation of the oxalates to CO2. One of the reasons this is precisely known is that we can very precisely quantify the amount of Fe2+, plus generated through complexation with the phenanthrolene ligand. So this is a very brightly colored molecule, the iron 2 phenanthrolene complex. And so we can do absorption spectroscopy on this, take advantage of Beer's law to measure the amount of this complex, in turn measure the amount of Fe2 plus generated, and if we have precise knowledge of the number of photons impinging on the sample, we can calculate the quantum yield to a very precise degree. And this has been done over the years many, many times. This is a classical actinometer, and the value of that quantum yield is very precisely known. We also precisely know the molar absorptivity or the molar absorption coefficient of this iron phenanthrolene complex, and that's key in order to precisely measure the amount of iron that's generated. So how do we take this rather complicated chemical system and insert it into an experiment where we're trying to measure a different quantum yield? We'll see how that works on the next slide. So the way we do it is we essentially will say run our photochemical reaction of interest and decide we want to measure the quantum yield. We will then, instead of putting our, say, substrate, photocatalyst, whatever, into the reaction setup, we'll put our actinometer into the setup. Here, potassium ferrioxalate, in fact, is, is all we need to put in. So we insert our actinometer into the apparatus, whatever experiment we're running, and we find out from the actinometer, for example, we measure precisely the iron 2 plus yield. Going back to the previous slide, we can measure precisely the yield of iron 2 plus and work backwards to calculate that in photons have impinged on the actinometer in this apparatus. We then take out the actinometer and put in our system of interest, our photochemical reaction or, or substance engaging in a process whose quantum yield we want to know, and we can infer from the actinometer experiment that the same number of photons, as long as the conditions are the same, are impinging on the sample in a given period of time. And we'll want to repeat this, of course, a number of times to ensure reproducibility and to make sure that, for example, the time delay when we're switching out the actinometer for the system of interest or any other maybe subtle changes we're making don't actually change the number of photons impinging on the sample in a profound way. So the potassium ferrioxalate oct actinometer is, is but one of many, many options uh, for chemical actinometry. However, I'll just in closing say that this is a very commonly applied method still for measuring quantum yields because of this issue of the difficulty of counting photons. An actinometer provides you with a precisely calibrated connection between a chemical outcome, for example, the yield of Fe2 plus in this ferrioxalate decomposition, and the number of photons impinging on the system to make that happen.